Good morning, everyone. My name is Philip, and today I'm going to tell you everything you always wanted to know about pens but were afraid to ask. This talk today is based on work that I did with four awesome colleagues of mine, Dan, Max, Marcos, as well as Adam. However, I also included work from many, many other researchers that spent their time on this type of research within the last years. But first, what are those questions that you may ask yourselves? Well, first of all, I think the most basic question is the question, why are we using pins at all? I mean, there are other forms of authentication that we can use. Why pins? And then from a researcher's perspective, um, there's also the attacker, and in all cases, there's the attacker that tries to attack us. So which attacks are out there that an attacker can use in order to get hold of our pins? And then it's a very consequent question just to ask which defense is out there as well. And from then on, you may say, okay, pins can have different length. They can be short ones, long ones, something in the middle. What is the ideal pin length that one should choose? And from then on, you may say, okay, what about randomly generated pins? Are they good? Are they bad? Memorable? Not memorable? We're going to have a look at that as well. And from then on, we're going to look a bit about the uh, into the uh, developer's perspective. And then block lists are a topic that um, is very useful. And we're going to look at how we can increase the security of the chosen pins by using such block lists. Another topic that's always also interesting is to look at things in comparison. Um, there are other forms of authentication, for example, the very famous passwords, <laughs> but also patterns. The latter mostly used for, by, uh, for mobile authentication. And then also some of you may say, well, I don't care at all. I use a biometric, for example, fingerprint face. Why should I care at all about pins? And we will also look at why that might be important even for those of you who use a biometric. But first things first, why pins? And the answer to that is simple because pins are basically everywhere. What do I mean with everywhere? Well, let's have a look at some examples. Um, I think the most basic one and that you can also think of is a mobile phone. Smartphones use pins all over the place and many, many participants, even in our study, used it. About 60% of the participants uh, use a pin. But this is only one of the, let's say, two big areas where pins are used. The other one, banking. If I withdraw money with my credit or debit card, I have to type in the PIN. And the very same holds when I go shopping in the supermarket or in all other places where I pay with my card, I also have to type in this PIN. These are, let's say, modern versions where you are, modern scenarios where you use a PIN. There are old-fashioned ones as well. For example, I can lock my bike with a lock that uses a PIN. But not only a bike, but also um, a door can be locked with a padlock, for example. This is the like traditional old-fashioned way. There are also modern versions of that, and thank you, Pair, for this picture. Um, you can lock your door with these modern ones as well. And now, if we would have traveled to Sweden this year, some of you may also have seen this in their rooms, a safe. And many of them also use a pin. And if someone wants to travel, someone has to have a suitcase. Um, suitcases sometimes also have pins. So integrated ones like this, but maybe also padlocks. But in many, many cases, there's a pin used in those cases. Okay, um, let's go back in history because we have seen there are many, many occasions where pins are used nowadays. What was one of the first occasions where pin were used in the past? We're in London, or Greater London, June 27th, 1967. That was the event where the first ATM was opened. Um, the first ATM was invented by John Shepard Barron, and he had the idea, well, I can basically get a chocolate bar everywhere. Why can't I get money everywhere? So he came up with this idea of a, let's say, cash dispenser, or what's later was called an ATM. And he also thought about security back in the days. And he said, well, I can still remember this number which is printed on the doc tag. 
um, that I got from the army back in the day. So six digits seems to be a reasonable number. So it's reasonably secure, but I can still remember it. So let's go with six digits. However, what he did, he also asked his wife and she said over the kitchen table that she can only remember four figures. So because of her, four figures became the world standard and the world standard that we're also using today. The cards that I just showed you, both of mine, use a four digit pin and I guess it's the very same for the cards that you have back home as well. Now let's look a bit closer into this quote of uh, Mrs. Shepard Barron. She said she could only remember four figures. Why is that and why some of you may still struggle with that even nowadays? That's because of letters like this one. Because these pins that we're using for our banking cards are usually system generated. And in 2015, who had I looked at the memorability of system generated pins? Because the big thing is that those aren't pins that we've chosen by ourselves, but they were just assigned to us. And they compared the memorability of different pin length, four, six, seven, and eight. And what they found was what Mrs. Shepard Barron said back in the days, four digit ones are more memorable than six, seven, or eight digit ones. That's kind of, uh, intuitive, I would say. Which is more counterintuitive, however, is the fact that six, seven, and eight digits were all um, more or less the same in terms of memorability. So if you have the task, for example, that you have to assign your customers a system generated pins and you say, okay, four digit pins is not secure enough. I would like to increase the pin length. Then it doesn't make a real difference whether you go with six, seven or eight digits. The subtitle, however, Can Chunking Help? also says that who had all looked at alternatives or ways that pins can be made or can be made more memorable. And what they looked at is chunking. And what is meant with chunking? Well, chunking an eight digit pin, for example, in the first four digit, looking at them separately, and then two pairs of twos each. And what they found, however, was is that none of those chunking policies, so the one that I just explained to you, but also all, all the ones which are possible, they are they don't make a pin more memorable. So unfortunately, bad news there, system generated pins, although they are secure because they are randomly selected from the complete key space, have their limitations, of course, in terms of memorability. Now you may say, why don't we select the pins just by ourselves? Um, the thing is that those pins are usually not system generated, not randomly generated. And um, Bono et al. looked at the security of banking pins in more detail. The scenario that they were looking at is a very scenario, a scenario that could happen to all of us. So we lose our wallet. And in this wallet, there is all of the banking cards, but also other sorts of information. But what the attacker wants to have is the money, of course, on the banking account. And now the big question is how many times can the attacker try? Because this is not an infinitive number of guesses that the attacker can make. The attacker can make up to six guesses. Why six and not three, you may say? Um, because in the scenarios over here, for example, if I type in my pins three times, usually three, uh, three times and you're out, is usually the rule there. However, those two scenarios, so withdrawing on one hand side and then using the card to pay, these have usually independent counters. So it gives um, the attacker the chance to try three times twice. So six tries, uh, six tries in total there. What can the attacker do with those six tries, you may say? Well, it's about a 2% success rate there for the attacker. And this is a not very intelligent attacker because what this attacker will do, he will just use the card and guess pins based on their frequency. So there's some general knowledge how people choose pins, we will look at this in more detail later. But I can already tell you that one, two, three, four is like the most popular four digit pin, for example. So the attacker will just try these pins. But of course, in the wallet, there's also other information. For example, there's usually your ID in your wallet as well. So the attacker has knowledge uh, or additional knowledge, for example, your birthday. And the attacker can use that knowledge 
because users choose their pins based on memorable things like for example birthdays and with this knowledge the success rate of the attacker increases up to eight percent now you may say how do users select pins in more detail and i just said that dates are something that users base their pins on and we also saw that in our study so in our study we asked participants to create pins four and six digit pins and we also asked them about the exact strategies that they had and one of our participants, for example, said, well, um, I just based it on the year I was born. And the pin was 1987 or 1987, probably the birth date or the birth year of this very participant. But some other participants said that they selected something memorable in general, so not actually a date. Um, an album cover, why is that? One of our participants said, well, it's a number I know well from a song, and the number was 867530. Uh, I looked it up because I had no connection to that song whatsoever, and the first hit was Tommy to Tone, and the, the song was 8675309, Jenny, and Tommy to Tone sing about this very number in their chorus all over the time. Um, all over the place. So that's a song from the 80s and this participant could still remember this phone number. So the participants based the pin on this phone number. So dates and things which are memorable in general are very popular strategies. There are strategies which are also based on patterns, however. So this is not something memorable because we have a personal connection to it, because but just because it's memorable. For example, one of our participants said, well, I just went down vertically from two to zero. So two, five, eight, zero was the pin. That is not a date in that specific purpose, uh, in the specific case, but just a pattern or a walk down the pin pad. Okay, so let's look at the attacks in more detail. We just said that an attacker can base the attack on information that the attacker has available or is available for the attacker of the victim. Since there are so many attacks, I would like to categorize them a bit. First of all, we want to look at the chance of the success. So we're going to have this on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have the fanciness of the attacks. So because there are attacks which are more or less fancy, and I'm going to show you some very fancy ones soon. But first, the ones that we just had. So the attacker has, for example, the wallet and some information about the victim. Using that information, the attacker can make the guesses, and this gives us a fairly successful um, attack, but also, and also fairly uh, fancy, I'd say. The other one that we just had is the one where there's no such information available, and the attacker just guesses in the general order which pins are chosen. Fairly fancy, or less fancy than the one that we had for the birthdays, for example, but the success rate is also lower. Now, another attack where also many of us may have been in the situation where this could have happened, and that's the solar surfing attacker. So if we sit in the park, for example, a cafe, public transport, there are so many people around us that could observe us when we type in the pin. And that gives the attacker the chance to observe this exact pin that we type in, and then the attacker is in possession of the pin. So actually an attack with a pretty high success rate because here we have one of the drawbacks that pins are not very complex um, knowledge-based authenticators unlike passwords for example um, so fairly fancy not very fancy so we could all do that um, uh, but it's also very successful but let's get fancy let's get really fancy um, an attacker could use side channels like an acoustic side channel and just by the sound that the numpad makes the attacker is able to get some information on the pin. However, you don't have to be uh, terribly concerned about this attack because yes, it's fairly successful but the ones that I was just explaining to you earlier are definitely more successful from an attacker's perspective. And this is also an attack which cannot be done like everywhere. For example, it's not possible to launch that attack on your phone. 
What's possible on your phone, however, is this uh, infrared based attack that we can see here. And it give, even gives us the exact order of the pins, because as we can see here, the pin one, two, three, six has been chosen. And the one way with tap is colder than for the six. Fairly fancy, or pretty fancy, I'd say. Um, the success rate, on the other hand, is also a bit higher than compared to the acoustic attack, but compared to the ones that we had earlier, um, that's really not a big attack. What we can all do, even without infrared cameras or some uh, acoustic attacks, is just look at the phone very closely. I have to admit, I took this phone on purpose and I cleaned the screen before I tapped on my phone because this is very important for this tech. Otherwise, the fingerprints will just fade in on all the other scratches and smudges which are on the screen. That's why this is usually not a very um, yeah, successful attack for pins. This is more important for patterns, for example. So less fancy, we can all do that, um, but the success rate is also very low because um, usually screens are not that clean. Talking about cleanness, talking about using a numpad very often, perfect example how not to do it. Here you can see the, the attacker, it's, oh, it's easy for the attacker because the numbers which are used for the pin are, can be seen like pretty easily. You definitely see the ones which are not used at all, like for example a nine, that is brand new. 1, 3, 5, and 7 are ever, however, are actively used. So from the attacker's perspective, it's like easy to guess which ones to type and which ones not to use. Very successful, however, not fancy at all because we can all detect this form of attack. We can all use that information. And Pear, for example, also had um, this form of attack um, with a different photo, though, back in his Twitter feed, and people were able to figure out the actual pin. Another attack, which is also very popular, it's a briefcase in general with money and that gives you access to many, many occasions, but this also helps you to get access um, or to get in possession of a pin. What I mean with this attack, however, is social engineering. It doesn't have to be a briefcase, it can also be a baseball bat or just a few drinks at the bar and then people will start to tell things. For example, the pin to, for example, the safe, the phone or whatever purpose. So this really is an attack which can be pretty successful depending on the number of baseball bats, number of drinks, number of well, or the amount of money. And um, so that's definitely an attack that is also launched out there. Another attack, more specific, however, are tools that are used mostly by law enforcement, so forensic tools that can be used in order to get access to the phone or also in order to get in possession of the pin which is used. Celebrite is just one example. There are also softwares by Alcom Soft or Grayshift. These ones, however, definitely require some form of technique, so the level of fanciness, I'd say, is pretty high. But in addition to that, the success rate is also pretty high. It's like nearly 100% in most of the cases because there's really nothing that you can do. Those attacks are based on flaws in the software and are possible on certain versions, on certain models, not in all cases, but in many. Okay, so you may say, oh my God, there are so many attacks out there. I don't want to use pins at all. Uh, let's look at some defenses. Some of you may say, well, I'm completely safe because I do not use a pin, I use a biometric. I use my fingerprint or my face to lock my phone. I'm not using a knowledge-based authenticator at all. Unfortunately, that's not true. If you are using a knowledge-based or a biometric for your phone, fingerprint, face or iris scan, as can be seen here on the right, you're definitely in, in all cases also using a knowledge-based authenticator. Biometrics are only a usability feature that pose some form of re-authentication to you so that you don't have to enter your knowledge-based authentic knowledge authenticator, which is password, pin, or pattern that many times. And in our study, we saw that pin is usually the choice that users go with. So 60%, as I also explained earlier, are used on 60% of the cases people go with the pin. 
So biometrics, unfortunately, are not a defense. Something that is done and that really helps, however, is rate limiting. That is, for example, implemented on phones. If I type in my pin falsely too many times, I may get this notification telling me, okay, that's enough for the moment. Please wait 30 seconds and this time increases one minute, two minutes, 10 minutes and so on. So I cannot make, I cannot make like too many guesses in a short amount of time. How many guesses can I make then? Well, on Android, it's really not limited. If I have all the time in the world, I can make all the guesses in the world. On Apple, the situation is completely different. On Apple, it's limited to 10 guesses and then the phone gets locked. So there's really a strict rate limiting here in place. Well, there's also a strict rate limit and we already had that for the paper by Bonuel Al banking. There's a strict limit of six guesses and then the attacker has no chance whatsoever to continue the attack. Rate limiting, unfortunately, requires some form of intelligent system. Systems which are not intelligent, bike lock, padlock, or my suitcase, then there's no chance of stopping the attacker. That's unfortunately the case. If the attacker doesn't get disturbed by anyone, then the attacker can continue and as long as the attacker wants to continue. Somewhere in the middle, are smart smart locks so to say and safes i googled that and there are definitely ones which have some rate limiting in place so in case you're thinking about getting one of those definitely look for a rate limiting usually it's about five or ten guesses and then the safe or the dog dog gets locked so definitely look one of uh, look out for one of those if you want to get some okay Let's say we want to stick with the pin and we're, for example, in the mobile authentication world where we can go with four or also six digit pin, let's say that. And we want to say, I uh, want to look at the most frequent pins which are used out there. So on the X axis, we have the frequency of the pins. And now let's look at place three and two. Pretty intuitively, I would say it happens what we would expect. If we go with the six digit pin, the six digit pin becomes more secure because, well, yeah, there are two more digits added to it. However, that's only half of it. If we look at the most popular pin for four and six digit, not a big surprise which ones they are. We see, however, that the one, two, three, four, five, six is way more popular than the counterparts in the four digit case. So coming from the attacker's perspective again, and I just find a random phone on the street, my chances to get access to it are twice as high if there has been a six or if there is a six digit pin in place. So just increasing the length coming again from the software developer or from the developers or manufacturers perspective is not always that easy. So yes, one, two, three, four might be insecure, but there are even more insecure choices. All right, so increasing the pin length does work to a certain extent, not in all cases though. Let's say we don't wanna go with pins. We want to go with another authenticator, for example, pattern or password. What can we do here? Well, we look at the number of guesses, again, that the attacker can make or the number of guesses that the attacker can make. And on the Y axis, we have the success rate of the attacker. So we want to end up in the lower left Many, many guesses, but not a high success rate. Where we don't want to add up is on the upper uh, on the upper left. We want to end up on the lower right. Because if the attacker makes just a few guesses and is very successful, that is really not a system that we want to employ. All right, let's look at the exact numbers. Patterns shown in orange here, as we can see, are the least secure ones. With only let's say 40 percent 40 guesses the attacker already guesses a very high percentage of the patterns out there the complete opposite happens however for passwords so if you want something secure go with the password the only drawback that passwords have is that they are pretty hard to type on mobile devices especially in small screens so then the pin might be the option to go with 
Let's look at uh, the security more detail. I just said that for Apple, the rate limiting is in place for 10 years and then the devices are locked. And what we can see here is that the six digit pins are more prone to attacks in general. And that's because of the one, two, three, four, five, six, and its high popularity that we've just saw on the other slide. All right, from then on, it 60 guesses onward, it happens what we might expect. Six digit pins become more secure. Let's block some pins. Let's block ourselves from using some pins, for example, the very popular ones or our birth date, for example, because as we just saw, the attacker is more successful then. What we can do if we are a developer, we can say, please don't go with the very popular ones. This is a warning that I just copied from Android, from Apple devices. If someone types in one, two, three, four and wants to use this very pin, then the person will see this message. If we're using a blacklist, again, we can show the success rate of the attacker in case such a blacklist is in place. And we compared the one from iOS in our study to a one that we came up with on our own with just 27 pins. And what we can see here, especially for the first 10 guesses which are possible on Android, the success rate really doesn't make a big difference there. The data-driven large blacklist which we tested was composed of nearly 3,000 pins and we end up with the distribution that we want. Many, many, many pins are secure there and the attacker has a very low successful uh, success rate because the all the pin distribution is very equally distributed across the pins which can be chosen. However, this comes unfortunately at a cost and the cost is a high block list hit rate. A high block list hit rate means that many, many participants see a warning and are forced to select a different pin. For example, in our study, one participant said, unfortunately, I cannot continue the study because all the pins are entered. I always get the message telling me that I have to select a different one. I'm sorry, I cannot continue. I double checked that there was no error in our study whatsoever. The participant just continued selecting pins which were blocked. So there really has to be a trade-off there between the usability and the security. And in our study, we found that about 10% or blocking about 10% of the general or the, about the, of the whole key space really helps and strikes the balance between usability and security. Takeaways, what did we learn today? Well, first of all, we just reminded ourselves that pins are literally everywhere. They are used in very modern situations, but also old fashioned padlocks can be used with a pin. Then we had a look at some of the attacks, some of the fancy ones, some of the more normal ones, some of the ones we can launch at home, but also some which require um, a yeah, very sophisticated attacker. And then at the very end, we just looked at some defenses, um, some that do work, some that really don't work pretty well. And um, yeah, I just explained to you what we can do about insecure pins and how we can make them more secure. And that brings me to the end of my talk. If you have any questions left, which I haven't answered, feel free to ask them now or also later. Thank you.